for joining us tonight for the VMC Animal Health Education Series. And on behalf of our team, I would like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. My name is Scott Horsfall, and I partner with clients and clinicians at the Veterinary Medical Center to serve animals and their families. The VMC Animal Health Education Series features our leading experts covering a variety of topics in veterinary medicine, ranging from relevant health information for your beloved pets to ways that we're advancing clinical research that will serve dogs, cats, and people for generations to come. During the presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. We also ask for pre-submitted questions and we'll do our best to cover the themes that came up most frequently during the final portion of the program. Please note that if your question for tonight's presentation relates to your pet's specific medical care, it is best to call the VMC directly or have your primary care veterinarian contact our team for consultation so that we can best serve your family. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Chris Stouthammer. Dr. Stouthammer is an associate professor in the Veterinary Clinical Sciences Department of the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota and the head of our cardiology department at the Veterinary Medical Center. He received his DVM degree from the University of Illinois and completed advanced training in comparative cardiology at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Stouthammer is a diplomat with the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine for Cardiology. We're grateful to have Dr. Stouthammer with us tonight to discuss non-invasive treatment options for pets with heart disease. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Stouthammer. Thank you, Scott. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And hopefully everybody can see that. <clears throat> and so welcome. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about uh, one of my passions uh, when it comes to veterinary cardiology, and that is uh, providing uh, uh, treatment options that don't necessarily actually involve surgery. So as the title of the talk is avoiding the scalpel and kind of reviewing some of our different options out there when it does come uh, for uh, treatment of heart disease. Yeah, as soon as my computer starts responding here, there we go. So as you guys can imagine, uh, heart disease is a big deal. Um, and it's certainly a big deal when it comes to veterinary medicine and uh, the overall care of our uh, beloved pets. We know that about 10% of our pets uh, will have heart disease at any given moment in time. And that certainly that pre the overall prevalence will increase uh, as they age. Uh, some studies feel that uh, in our senior animals uh, kind of defined about 13 years of age, 90% uh, of those uh, pets uh, will have uh, evidence of heart disease. And just like as in human medicine, uh, you know, unfortunately heart disease um, often leads uh, to death. And it is consistently reported as in the top three causes of, of death of our uh, pet animals. Uh, so again, heart disease is a big deal. And unfortunately, uh, just overall survival rates are pretty short as well. Yes, we have great medications and, and what we can do now with medical therapy is, is by far superior than even 10 years ago. Um, but we still have the, the fact that you know, heart disease um, uh, will eventually result in death. Um, and also it can really compromise the quality of life. And that's what really kind of, uh, you know, some of these puppies and kittens uh, you'll see is uh, these animals unfortunately had a pretty uh, drastic poor quality of life. And then fortunately, as we're able to fix their heart disease, you know, that resolves. You know, some of the common clinical signs that we see of heart disease is marked exercise intolerance. These poor puppies are trying to run around and be active. They just don't have the energy to be a normal puppy. Or you know, maybe they overdo uh, it uh, uh, trying to be playful and then they actually pass out or have a fainting episode. Um, and so the other big one is, and certainly if you guys have ever had to uh, unfortunately have a pet uh, that has heart disease, know that it can often mark, uh, result in marked respiratory distress. As we can see here in the bottom right corner, you know, this poor uh, kitty and this poor uh, um, beagle here, um, you know, are really working to breathe. And that is because they are in a state of what we call left-sided congestive heart failure, where they actually have fluid that's starting to build up in their lungs. And that's what's causing that respiratory distress. The top photo here is a, an absolute adorable uh, golden retriever pup uh, that had the uh, right-sided congestive heart failure. And so you can see that fluid that's building up in her ab his abdomen, I'm sorry, her abdomen, I, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, building up in her abdomen. 
Uh, and you can imagine just how uncomfortable she would be, as well as the fact that she's not going to be able to eat a normal amount of food. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, it's going to become rather malnourished. Um, so it's all coming back to you know, heart disease is a big deal. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of surgical options for heart disease. Um, the big problem, though, is when it comes to surgery is the heart's really difficult to gain access to. And, you know, it's in the thorax, it's under those ribs, it's under the lungs a lot of tissue to work your way through just to see the heart. Um, so very invasive uh, procedure that will lead to a very high rate of, uh, um, of unfortunately morbidity and mortality associated with those procedures and very long uh, recovery times. You know, you're not gonna just bounce back after your, your heart surgery. It's gonna take weeks and months of, of recovery before we're, we're back to our old self again. And, and you know, because of that, uh, you know, I've always, really wanted to find methods of treatment uh, that avoided actually making that incision in the first place. You know, the other big limitation though, when it comes to surgery is it's not very many centers are able to do uh, this type of work because of the fact that when you, if you actually open the heart, you know, the heart pumps blood, it receives lots of blood in a continuous manner. And so obviously if you just uh, incise the heart, you're gonna have uncontrolled hemorrhage. And so the surgeons in order to even see and, and control hemorrhage, they need to resort to a very advanced technology such as a cardiac bypass, where we basically hook the heart to an artificial pump and kind of drain the blood coming into the heart and, and while continuously to pump that out to, to the body to ensure uh, normal organ function. So again, you know, surgery is just not a very good option for most uh, uh, veterinary centers. And that's why we kind of work to develop uh, non-surgical methods to treat heart disease. You know, what works in our favor is the heart's connected to lots of blood vessels. Um, as you can see in the schematic here on the left, uh, you know, there's arteries and veins running everywhere throughout the body. And if we can gain access to any of those vessels, we can follow them up back to the heart. Now, if you remember back from the days of high school biology, um, the heart, uh, you know, uh, receives blood from the veins and takes that blood from the veins and pumps it to the lungs. That's through the right side of the heart. So if we need to gain access to the right side of the heart, uh, we'll go up through a vein uh, and then enter the heart that way. And the left side of the heart uh, takes blood from the lungs and pumps that back out to the body uh, through the arteries. So if we need to gain access to the left side of the heart, we'll go up through an artery um, and, and follow that course until we get to, to the level of the heart. So how do we do that? Well, largely it's through use of catheters and what we call guide wires. Um, and basically with the right sh uh, shaped uh, catheter and the flexible uh, um, guide wire, we can get uh, uh, basically maneuver all the way up through a blood vessel into the level of the heart. Um, and it's pretty remarkable with the technology nowadays with the different shapes and the materials that these catheters are made of, and, and what uh, you know, little tiny uh, um, uh, structure that you can uh, catheterize uh, from you know, quite a big distance away. Um, and uh, these are all designed to carry different devices uh, and different uh, treatment options when it comes uh, to the heart. So the first part of the, our procedure when we do one of these um, is to uh, gain access to a blood vessel. And this is what's really become cool now is that we can do this without even making an incision. So, how, I mean, again, how cool is that? You have heart surgery without even an incision. You go home that same day, you know, there's no sutures or no stitches to take out and recovery is pretty much instantaneous. So how do we gain access? Uh, well, we have to get uh, um, this, what is called a uh, vascular introducer sheet. Basically it's a little portal uh, that is placed into a blood vessel, much in the same way if you ever received IV fluids or had anesthesia, they would place a standard catheter. And we can do this uh, directly through the skin and then kind of size up by initially getting a smaller one in place and putting a wire across and then in exchanging it out for larger ones. Um, and that works uh, pretty well. Uh, and usually you can just feel the vessel directly, uh, uh, you know, if it's superficial enough or it's, you know, just under the skin. Uh, or for those that are deeper, we use ultrasound guidance. So up here in this uh, image up on the top right, you see uh, a needle coming into a uh, that's actually a blood vessel. Um, and so those deeper vessels that we need to gain access to will visualize directly with ultrasound uh, and then direct the needle uh, while watching with ultrasound and then pass uh, our wires and eventually our, our sheath into place. 
Occasionally, though, we still have to do a good old what is known as cut down, where we actually do make an incision. So I'm cheating a little bit here with my talk title. Um, there are times where we still have to make incisions, but we're not making an incision over the, the lungs or the thorax. We're making a little teeny incision, uh, usually over the neck uh, to gain access to the vessels in the neck or in the inner thigh to gain the access to those uh, vessels uh, in, in the hind leg. Um, so a very tiny incision is made uh, and then we directly catheterize that vessel. Um, it used to be that all of our procedures were done that way and now only a select few are still done that way. So kind of illustrate what we can do when it comes to heart disease. I just wanna go through a number of cases today. Uh, I wanna first start off with Tiny. Um, Tiny is the, the uh, little dog on the right. Uh, and I saw Tiny um, back in 2013. And at that time, Tiny was already five years old, uh, only about uh, three pounds. Uh, so she's living up to her name uh, that she was Tiny. And Tiny was just recently rescued from a puppy mill um, through a, a fantastic rescue organization known as Underdog uh, uh, Dogs uh, or Underdog uh, Rescue. And uh, they had just recently rescued her. And at the time that she was rescued, uh, a heart murmur was noted. And uh, the uh, initial foster had also noted that uh, Tiny uh, was not uh, an overly uh, rambunctious dog. Um, and, and basically, uh, after kind of describing what uh, her activity level and everything were, uh, we actually realized that she was having fairly marked exercise intolerance. Like she wanted to exercise and be playful, she just couldn't. So because of the presence of that heart murmur, though, that the rescue had contacted me to ask what they should do next, and I had recommended taking a set of x-rays. Uh, and x-rays provide us with a good, good overall assessment of just the size of the heart. And if it's mi misshapen, uh, we can start to get an idea of what we're dealing with. So Tiny's x-rays are on the top. Um, and hopefully you can see my cursor here. Uh, this is a view of Tiny lying on her side, and this is a view of her lying on her back. Now, below uh, is a view or a set of normal x-rays to help compare to, uh, in case you guys aren't radiologists. But what we can see is even though her name is Tiny, and, and Tiny was quite tiny, her heart was not. She had severe heart enlargement. As you can see here, um, it's occupying most of her chest. The blackout here is lungs. And there's not much room here for her lungs compared to a normal dog you can see down below. Uh, her heart was just dramatically enlarged. And we can see that there was a large bump sitting right here. And that is the area coming off of what we call the aorta, the large artery that leads the heart. Uh, normally you should not have that bump as you can see down here in the normal. So very, very severe heart enlargement. And even more importantly, we looking at her lungs, there's a lot of haziness out there. Her lungs should be much more black as you can see in uh, these views here. Um, and again, the, there's what little lung you can see, they're not very black, there's haziness there. And that indicates that she has some fluid there. So poor Tiny was actually uh, in a state of congestive heart failure. Now, due to the severity of changes here, you know, we had recommended doing an ultrasound of a heart or an echocardiogram. And uh, what we have here is tiny on the left, and then this is normal on the right, just to kind of help uh, uh, illustrate the changes that we're seeing in tiny. And my computer is just freezing up here, but what we see here uh, in tiny, this, is, um, this view is called a, a four chamber view and that we can see the four chambers of the heart. So again, that just for a quick uh, review, the heart uh, does contain four chambers and it's divided into two sides, the left side, that has a top chamber called the atrium and the, uh, the, uh, the um, bottom chamber called the ventricle, which is the main pumping unit. And then again, on the right side, the same thing, a, a right atrium and a, a right ventricle. And so what we see here in tiny is that we have severe enlargement of the left atrium and severe enlargement of the left ventricle. Now, the right heart is up here even though that looks really small, it's actually quite normal. It's just that uh, the left side was quite diseased. And I'll play the normal here. So this is what a normal left heart should look like relative to the right heart. And again, you look at over a tiny, you can see just how much large the, uh, the two chambers of the left heart are. Uh, so here's uh, a cross-sectional view. And I'll play that. So this again is normal. And then this was tiny. And we just see how markedly dilated her heart was. So the big question is, why is her heart so dilated? 
And what we found is she has a condition known as a patent ductus arteriosus. And I'll explain that here in a minute. Um, but this is what it looks like under ultrasound. And basically there's a blood vessel sitting there that should not be there. And uh, since it's present, um, it allows for blood to shunt across uh, between the two great arteries that leave the heart, the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And that vessel acts to redirect blood back into the heart, making the heart work a lot harder than it normally would. And that's why Tiny's heart was so dilated and why we were already in a congestive heart failure state. So again, this condition is called a patent ductus arteriosus. And basically, it's a blood vessel that connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery. Now you're actually, this is a normal blood vessel that's present during embryologic development. So while we're developing, you know, as a fetus, uh, this vessel is opened uh, uh, as a way to direct blood away from the non-functional lungs. But then once the uh, baby is born, that vessel should close. And most, for the most part it does, um, but it is fairly common for it to fail to do so. And then that can lead to all sorts of havoc. So again, when it fails to, to close, we call this a patent ductus arteriosus or PDA for short. And uh, what it does is it acts as a sh short circuit, uh, allowing for blood to come up from the, leaving the heart through the aorta to come back into the pulmonary artery and then transverse to the lungs and then come right back to the heart. So blood just keeps coming back to the heart. It doesn't leave the heart the way it should. And that's why we see uh, the heart enlargement and eventually heart failure. So as I said before, this is a very common form of heart disease in young dogs and cats, as well as in our large animal species. And it's a serious form of heart disease. Uh, Tiny was lucky. She was five when this was caught. And we know that uh, about 60% of dogs and cats will die in their first year of life if this is not treated. They die of congestive heart failure, irregular heart rhythms, or what we call arrhythmias and a condition called pulmonary hypertension or you restart getting high blood pressure within your lungs. So despite it being so serious, the good news is it can be cured. And once that vessel is, is closed, um, our heart will actually return back to normal function. Even if we're older like tiny, we can still see that normalization of heart function. So how do we close it? Well, for years we did the standard of surgical ligation uh, where basically we'd have a surgeon make an incision over the left uh, uh, thoracic wall and kind of dissect down through the lungs to the level of the heart, identify that vessel and tie it off. Uh, so you can see here, here's an animal having that procedure done. Uh, where everything's draped in in surgical drapes here. We do have our incision that's being made. And this is actually lung coming across through here, kind of creeping in the field. And then uh, right under the lung is that blood vessel that they're tying off. And here's the uh, suture material um, that they're using to tie that off. Well, that works, um, but it, obviously it's very invasive. It's a huge incision that needs to be made. Um, so a fairly long recovery time afterwards. And um, besides all of that, it's actually fairly dangerous. I mean, you're right up against the heart trying to, to, to tie this vessel off. This vessel tends to tear and then you can have severe hemorrhage that can be uncontrolled. And so we do see a perioperative uh, mortality rate of about 5%. Well, that seems pretty low, but that's five animals out of a hundred. Um, so that's actually quite high. So we um, actually at the University of Minnesota and work with a, a company called AGA Medical um, that's here in the, the, the metropolitan area, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, developed a device uh, to occlude these via catheter. And so it's called the Amplatz canine duct occluder. So I'm sorry for cat owners. Uh, we'll talk about how we handle this in, in cats here in a minute. Um, this one is specifically developed for a dog's PDA. Um, and what's nice about this is um, it is delivered through a catheter. And so you can see that here's the actual device here. And it's designed to fit inside that blood vessel and, and plug it up instantly. But it's made out of a very compressible metallic uh, substance called nitinol. And uh, it allows us to pull it inside of a catheter. So here it's completely loaded inside of a catheter. And what we'll do is we'll catheterize uh, the hind leg uh, through the artery, and then we'll pass this device up to the level of the heart and then uh, drop it off uh, inside that uh, PDA or that abnormal blood vessel, plugging it up. So this is tiny. Um, again, this was back in 2013 that we did this. And uh, 
you can see here's the device and it's being positioned right in her PDA. Um, so again, uh, this is the entire device here. It's being deployed through this little catheter here. And then this, again, this entire shadow here is her massively enlarged heart. So uh, Tiny's head would be positioned over here. Um, and you can see her, her butt and her hind legs would be over here. And then now this is, uh, again, from Tiny, the device has been released. And then what we'll do follow up is we'll inject a little contrast here. And so we're injecting contrast to document that uh, we are uh, plugging that vessel up, that the device is in the right place. And, and overall, we're very happy with how things are going with this procedure. So again, instead of doing that large uh, incision right over the uh, thorax uh, going in between the ribs, which you can see the ribs here, um, we made a little tiny incision or actually can now do it with ultrasound guidance and go directly into the artery and just drop off the device. Not only is it uh, uh, allowing us to avoid uh, the scalpel altogether, it is also uh, a much superior uh, treatment option than surgery and that it has a much higher rate of efficacy in causing complete occlusion of that vessel, uh, whereas surgery tends to have some residual flow that can present for problems down the road and it's much safer. Um, uh, the mortality rate with this surgery is, is less than 1%. Um, so again, anything we can do to make these procedures safer for our patients is, is a huge benefit. So here's uh, Tiny and follow-up. And uh, here's a set of x-rays. Again, we can see our, our heart. Uh, but one thing we noticed is her heart uh, already started reducing in size, even on the, the following day. And then I continue to follow uh, up uh, with Tiny for a year, watching the size of her heart as it steadily regressed in size. So uh, here's the x-ray and you can see the device sitting across here. And uh, we do most of our follow-up with echo or ultrasound of the heart. And again, we were able to see that vessel, but now uh, that vessel is completely occupied by that device. So here's the device here. PA stands for pulmonary artery and AO stands for aorta and it's positioned in the right spot. But Tiny continued uh, to do quite well and actually we no longer needed to follow her up after that year. Um, well, that was back in 2013. When I was putting together this talk, I actually was contacted by Tiny's owners at the end of April. Unfortunately, Tiny has just recently passed. Uh, she was almost at 13 years of, of life. Um, and uh, she ultimately was, was, had to be euthanized uh, because she had uh, uh, signs of a stroke. Um, had nothing to do with her, her original heart disease because that was considered to be cured. So she did live uh, almost eight years following her surgery and only needed to follow up with us for that first year afterwards. And the, the owner had written a really nice letter and, uh, and in there detailed uh, kind of like what she saw with Tiny afterwards. And, and I just wanted to share a couple lines because I really just touched me and that uh, the owner had confided that she was really hesitant to initially adopt her because the foster had said that, uh, you know, Tiny wasn't overly active individual, just seemed to be kind of um, aloof and uh, just not engaged with the family. And as you can see there, you know, the owner comments was that uh, Tiny would run so fast her fluffy ears would act like wings and that she never tired, never winded or missed an opportunity to participate in life. And so I was really touched uh, by uh, this owner's uh, um, one, tracking me down, and then two, uh, sending me that information. Um, another example here is my own dog. Wait. Let that play through. And that was me. Um, and actually, I'll rewind that. So Squeak also had a PDA that uh, I rescued her um, uh, when she presented to our clinic at the university uh, for evaluation of her PDA or heart murmur. Um, and uh, at the time she was, uh, um, uh, they were going to euthanize her. And so I decided to, to go ahead and, and uh, rescue her and uh, clued her PDA. And I, I you know, was just finishing up my residency and decided it was time to get a puppy. Um, but to illustrate how like Squeak's heart went back to normal, her and I took up competitive scajoring. And so this is a, a video loop of us uh, um, at the um, Chuck and Don's uh, uh, scajoring race. It's the largest uh, uh, scajoring race uh, um, that occurs, and it actually occurs here in Minneapolis. We try to have it on the, the, uh, um, the ice, uh, but occasionally we'll have it in random parks as well. And uh, I'll play that back. And that's my mom who likes to make cameo appearances in all my talks. 
And you can see there that uh, Squeak obviously does not have any exercise intolerance as we take off. Um, this was actually a photo of us on CNN, uh, and you can see I don't look very good there, but uh, as Squeak, you can just see uh, she's a pure athlete, uh, and uh, she is uh, still uh, doing quite well at 13 and a half. Um, but to kind of give you some illustration, too, for those uh, of you guys that are all about the kitties, and you're like, okay, enough about these dogs, um, here is Horace. Uh, Horace uh, presented to us for evaluation of a heart murmur. Uh, when he was three and a half years old, uh, and uh, again in a rescue situation, and these are photos uh, uh, from uh, uh, that time. You can see he's absolutely adorable, and uh, Horace had a PDA as well. Now we can't go putting in uh, a device that has canine in its name, uh, um, and so we have to use a little bit different device uh, for cats, um, mainly because uh, that the device that we used in Squeak and in the, and uh, used in Tiny. Um, is actually too large uh, for the blood vessels of cats. Uh, so what we do there is we modified and come up with a, a little bit different procedure that works really well. And so instead of coming through the arteries, uh, we come in through the veins. And so what you can see here is Horace having his PDA occluded. And what we have here is a catheter that's coming up through the veins, coming into the heart, and then actually coming all the way through the heart and then catheterizing that blood vessel from this direction. So it's just amazing what you can gain access to with the right catheter and the right wire. So we have that catheter in the right spot now, and what we're using is actually a coil. And as you can see, the, the coil gets its name because it looks like a little spring. And on that spring, which you can't see with x-ray, is uh, the uh, there's a lot of little silk fibers on there. But those silk fibers will create a blood clot and will plug that blood vessel up. So this is us positioning that coil in Horus here. Now it's right in the level of the, the PDA. And then here we've released that coil and now we're gonna uh, inject some contrast uh, and just to document it's in the right spot and there's no flow coming through there. So again, this is the, the aorta here and you can see it's kind of wanting that contrast is wanting to uh, recirculate through the PDA but it hits that coil and gets stopped. So that's the main pulmonary artery there. So coming up and then stopped. Uh, before this, the contrast would have shot straight through and back into the heart. So that was Horace, and this is the adventures of Horace. Uh, Horace is actually now owned by one of my uh, uh, co-workers, uh, who's an amazing individual, and, and Horace often uh, kind of follows him along, and you can see uh, uh, here helping out with uh, work and uh, also uh, getting a nice bike ride in. Uh, so Horace is, is also doing quite well after that procedure. So I wanna shift gears a little bit now and talk about Rudy. Uh, Rudy here, uh, as you can see, this is Rudy, and this is Rudy's uh, sister. Um, and Rudy at the time, uh, a presentation to me was a five month old, uh, kind of a lab shepherd mix. And uh, you know he doesn't look very big here and he wasn't. Uh, Rudy uh, was really malnourished, uh, really didn't have any energy. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the biggest problems is he has a belly just full of fluid. So this is his abdomen here, his belly, and you see how distended he is. Kind of makes you think about those puppies that have really bad worm uh, um, infections, um, but he didn't have that. Um, and so he, he presented initially to an uh, internal medicine specialist, and then they referred uh, Rudy over to us. And uh, upon presentation for us, just kind of illustrate again of just how malnourished Rudy is. This, oops, uh, this is uh, Rudy uh, going down the treatment hall to cardiology. We got our tail wagging. Oh, you can hear dogs barking in the background. But look at that big distended abdomen and just how thin he looks along his spine. He was in a state of right-sided congestive heart failure. So that was pre-tap, and then when they have so much fluid in the abdomen like that, and they're so uncomfortable, we have to, to tap and remove that fluid. And this is Rudy coming back from his tap, much, much happier and doesn't want to sit still. But again, you can appreciate just how uh, thin he is and malnourished he is from being in that state of heart failure. So you know, our next step here was to figure out what exactly was going on with Rudy. And really what Rudy had was an extra heart chamber. Instead of having four chambers to his heart, he had five. And that extra heart chamber was creating all sorts of havoc for him. So officially the name is called Core Triatriatum Dexter. I know it's kind of a huge mouthful, 
but basically uh, he had some remnants of uh, his fetal heart structure that should no longer be present. Um, and what we're seeing here is, uh, this is a view that illustrates the four chambers of the heart. So we talked about the left atrium here, the left ventricle here, and then there should just be one chamber here called the right atrium, and then one chamber here of the right ventricle. But in Rudy here, you have two. And you can see this little kind of uh, uh, little uh, bright uh, coloring coming through here and things a little bouncing around. Those is that, that's actually echo contrast. And so we administer some contrast uh, in a, uh, the veins of the forelimb and the hind limb to, to kind of document uh, the way the blood is flowing. And what was happening here was blood was coming into this chamber from the blood vessels in the back half of his body, from his liver, um, from you know, the GI tract and all of that, and it would come up into this blind chamber and would just sit there. It wasn't able to gain access to the heart. Uh, there was no flow across this wall here. Um, there's a kind of a, uh, what this looks like in a, a, a real life individual. And again, you just have those two separate chambers all together. So poor Rudy uh, needed this chamber or this wall to be broken down because um, that would then allow blood coming in on this side, that blind pouch to gain access to the heart and be pumped through and would alleviate uh, all that abdominal fluid he had in that malnourished state that he was in. So overall, a pretty simple procedure. So I was really excited to take Rudy uh, to the, what we call the cath lab, where we do our procedures. Um, before we did that, though, we did do a CT and uh, to document, uh, again, to get a better idea of the anatomy. So this is a CT scan of Rudy's heart. Uh, it's what we call an angi angiography uh, or angiogram. And basically, we use contrasts in the CT. And uh, this, again, is Rudy's heart. And what we're seeing here is, this is the normal right atrium, normal right ventricle, and then this is that blind pouch over here. So blood coming up from the liver, this is the liver, uh, would come through and then just get stuck there. And then also looking at it, his liver was very abnormal. This is not normal liver tissue. And it's from all that congestion um, and lack of normal blood drainage was actually leading to pretty significant liver dysfunction uh, on top of his, his heart failure. Um, so this is a, a, an angiogram taken from the time of his surgery. Uh, we have a catheter coming in uh, uh, up from the back half of his body. So we basically catheterized the, the vein and the leg and came up into the level of that blind pouch and then again administered contrast. So again, uh, head is over here, the spine or back is up through here, and then this is Rudy's heart. So we administer contrast. And you see it just comes in and just kind of stops and just hangs out there. And so again, this is why we were having such significant problems in Rudy. And what we needed to do with our procedure is to punch through that membrane or that wall and reestablish a connection. And so how that is done is we have a special catheter here that actually has a very sharp needle on the end of that. And so we push the catheter up against the membrane and have the needle in place and we're also simultaneously injecting some contrast to make sure we're in the right spot. Because as you can imagine, it's a little bit dangerous. If the needle gets uh, 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 pushed through the wrong wall, we can actually uh, create uh, uncontrolled hemorrhage. So once we had the right spot, we'd uh, uh, engage that needle and it, in theory should break that, that wall through or break through that wall and allow us uh, to gain access to the other side. Unfortunately, that didn't work in Rudy. So in Rudy, we were in surgery over eight hours trying to get through that wall. The needle just kept pushing that wall around uh, and often would push it up against to the, the beginning of the heart up here. Uh, and that was in too dangerous of a, a spot for us to deploy, fully deploy that needle. Um, so the needle, the tip of it wasn't sharp enough to, to actually cross through. Uh, and that wall or that membrane was too thick. Uh, here's another image uh, where we're injecting contrast through that catheter. Again, we were just pushing and pushing on that wall, making sure that uh, we're in the right spot and, and trying to get across. But after eight hours, and Rudy wasn't doing very well under anesthesia, we were all exhausted and we had to call it quits. And you can imagine just how that would, you know, just feel uh, that feeling of defeat. Uh, you're letting a, a, a little puppy down um, because, you know, this puppy's going to die if we can't fix this. 
Um, but obviously we can't just keep trying what's not working. And after eight hours, uh, you know, we really worry about our patient not being stable. So we woke uh, Rudy up and unfortunately I had to call uh, his owners and uh, explain to them what happened. Um, and then, you know, quickly we went to the drawing board to try to figure out how can we best address this issue. Uh, and so what we ended up uh, doing is that uh, a couple weeks later, we tried take two. And uh, what we did differently this time is we identified a company uh, that uh, uh, makes a special needle for uh, situations like this and within human medicine, um, where they need to cross or break down a, a wall as well, and it's too thick, especially in elderly patients. And, and, and so that standard needle that we were using before just won't work. And so this needle is different in that it's not sharp, but it actually uses radio frequency to, to basically hammer through or puncture through that wall. Uh, so it's much safer because you don't have a sharp needle that you're just poking out uh, inside of the heart. Uh, and it allows for a more controlled uh, um, uh, access across uh, that, uh, that wall or you're, you're trying to gain access through. Uh, and so uh, we contacted that company to find out how expensive the needle was. And I, I kid you not, it was over $100,000. So we kind of thought, oh, well, that obviously isn't going to work. Um, but then we do what uh, most veterinarians are quite good at. And we kind of begged and showed uh, the company lots and lots of pictures of Rudy and just kind of talked about, you know, this poor puppy's going to die if we don't do something about it. And so the company was gracious enough to actually donate the needle, that, uh, the special needle to us. Um, so this is uh, footage from Rudy's second procedure. Uh, and uh, again, it's very similar to what you just saw there, different type of needle, but here we're again, we're injecting contrast, ensuring we're in the right spot. And then we turned on radio frequency and literally within a nanosecond, we popped right across. Uh, and so, you know, after spending eight hours, I was just flabbergasted at how easy that was. And I can understand why they can charge the amount that they can charge for, but just very gracious uh, that they were uh, willing to donate that to us. And so, now we were able to move forward with what we had set out uh, in the first place with Rudy. And that is uh, we were going to balloon dilate that wall open and create a large communication there. And that's what you see here. So this is a balloon catheter, kind of like angioplasty. And we inflated that balloon and, uh, and really tore that membrane open uh, with that balloon and to kind of reestablish blood flow. So this was Rudy again uh, at Christmas time uh, prior to our surgery. And then this is Rudy a year later. So obviously uh, uh, caught up with this litter mate and is doing super well and uh, uh, very uh, thankful uh, clients uh, and, and, you know, for that company and donating that, that special uh, catheter that allowed us to do that. So another case that's really dear to my heart uh, is Kitty Wampus. And uh, Kitty Wampus is, is actually owned by one of my favorite former students, who's now a very successful veterinarian out in the, the uh, Twin Cities area. And uh, Kitty Wampus uh, originally presented to us when uh, she was eight years old, uh, eight years old, uh, eight months old, uh, she was a kitten. And uh, uh, she was diagnosed uh, with a heart murmur and ultimately what is known as an atrial septal defect. So uh, here's Kitty Wampus's echo. And what we can see here is uh, this is our heart again. This is the, the left atrium of the heart. Uh, this is the left ventricle, right atrium and right ventricle. And the right side of her heart was too enlarged. Uh, she wasn't in failure yet, but uh, unfortunately with that heart enlargement was headed down that corner. That, that course. But what we can see there is she has a communication that should not be there, what is called an atrial septal defect. Again, this is the atrial septum. That should be a, a complete wall here that separates the right atrium from the left atrium. And sometimes that wall has a hole in it, a hole in the heart, uh, if you will. Uh, and uh, that then allows blood to uh, communicate between the, the two sides of the heart. And generally, this is going to cause what we call an overload state to the right side of the heart, causing right heart enlargement. And that's why Kitty Wampus's right heart is so enlarged and eventually congestive heart failure. Uh, so here's a kind of a schematic of what an atrial septal defect looks like. So now the heart, now the top of the heart is up here. This is the bottom of the heart here. 
uh, you can see that wall coming down that should be solid. And instead we have that hole or window going through there. And that allows blood from the left heart to cross into the right heart. So the right heart sees more blood than it normally should, causing that uh, heart enlargement and eventually heart failure. Now, fortunately for us, there's a beautiful little device called uh, an, am an Amplatzer septal occluder uh, that uh, is designed to plug these holes up and be uh, deployed through a catheter. Now, this is a human uh, manufactured device, but it really does work well in dogs and cats. And basically what you do is it catheterize one of the uh, blood vessels uh, in the hind legs. And generally this is done through a vein and you feed a catheter up into the heart, coming into the right side of the heart, crossing over that hole and then into the left side of the heart. And then there's a two disc uh, to this device. And so you deploy the outer disc first and then literally pull this disc up against that septum. And that's what you're seeing here. And then you deploy step three, um, that second disc. And then you release it and it's kind of nice and squished across there and basically creates an artificial wall that uh, the body will then cover up and uh, will act as a normal wall. So as the, the title here um, describes, yes, it, it really is that simple as it looks in humans. So in cats, different story. They have tiny vessels and, and overall tiny hearts. So with Kitty Wampus, uh, we first started uh, with the procedure. And uh, one thing you'll notice is we're coming now. Uh, so this is Kitty Wampus's heart right here. Our head is up here. So we're coming through the jugular vein or the vein in the neck. And so we catheterize that vein because it's the largest vein in the body that we can gain access to. Uh, and uh, pass that catheter down through that jugular vein uh, coming into the heart, and then we crossed over that defect. And so we're administering contrast now, confirming that our catheter is over here in the left atrium. So that part was really simple. And we're like, we got this. We're going to uh, save Kitty Wampus's life and, uh, you know, let's pat ourselves on the back. However, the next step is where things went wrong. So the catheter that is necessary to deploy this device is too big for Kitty Wampus. Um, and so we tried feeding it initially into the jugular vein and it just would not go. Um, and so like with Rudy's case, we had to take a step back um, and, uh, and actually wake Kitty Wampus up and regroup. And what we ended up doing uh, for Kitty Wampus is, uh, it was a hybrid approach. So again, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here because now we're gonna involve a surgeon. Um, so sometimes uh, we need to use catheters or devices that are just too big for the blood vessels. Um, and even though these devices are designed for to go through blood vessels through humans, you know, obviously a human is very, much, much bigger than a, a kitty wampus, whatever it will be. Um, and so what we can do though, in special circumstances, uh, again, is uh, do a limited surgery. Because um, if we were going to surgically repair this atrial septal defect or that hole in the heart, we would actually have to open the heart up and that requires cardiac bypass. Yes, again, it, it is something that is available at some centers. However, nobody can do it in a kitty. Uh, kitties are just too small. But what we can do is have a surgeon gain us the exposure to the outside of the heart and then we stick a catheter directly inside of the heart and deploy our device that way. That way we can do it without the need of bypass. We're not actually opening the heart. We're just catheterizing the heart. So that's what we did in Kitty Wampus. So after a few months of planning and, and a lot of uh, 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 mock trials and getting teams all ready to go, uh, we took uh, on Kitty Wampus's case again. And uh, what we see here now, uh, this black here is a retractor. So a surgeon has made an incision right over Kitty Wampus's heart. So this is our heart sitting here. And uh, uh, the, now coming through, we were able to directly look at the heart and I uh, took a catheter and stuck directly into uh, Kitty Wampus's heart and then was able to deliver that device. So here is the device uh, that is being used to occlude that defect. Um, here is still attached to a delivery cable. In case things weren't going well, we can always recapture it. And then eventually we were very happy with the placement of it, so we did release it. So here it is sitting across the, that uh, hole that was creating all the problem in Kitty Wampus. So how Kitty Wampus is, how's she doing? Well, nine months post-surgery, we can see her with her favorite toy. 
uh, and her favorite activity. She loves to eat. Now, one of the things I failed to mention is uh, if you watch her motion, she's a little herky jerky. Um, she has uh, what is known as uh, cellular Beller uh, disease and that uh, kind of the, the part of the brain that controls coordination and balance is, is uh, maldeveloped in, in Kitty Wampus. Um, and that's why she also has such a cute name. Uh, but Kitty Wampus is doing quite well. Um, we've been monitoring her device and her heart and uh, I've been very pleased with how things have gone for her. All right, uh, so kind of moving on, uh, I want to uh, talk about Hazy here. Hazy is a seven-year-old German short hair pointer that presented to us in December, and then she sees the snow in the parking lot. Uh, and uh, uh, she came into emergency in a state of uh, cardiogenic shock. Basically, she was flat out. She was very critical. Uh, was not uh, in a, a, a um, not doing very well at all. Um, so the, the criticalists examined her and right away noted uh, that she had a heart murmur and uh, ordered up a, an emergency cardiac evaluation because they figured, okay, there's something wrong with her heart that's causing her to be in the state of shock. I mean, she literally is dying and we need to figure it out right away. So we did an echo uh, and what we can see is in her right side of her heart, there's this large mass and that mass is obstructing the, the internal chambers of her heart. You know, blood is trying to get around, but it's being blocked by that mass. And so as her heart is beating, it just kind of moves back and forth, but nothing is able to get into her heart. And that's why she's literally uh, dying in the state of shock. And so what we did is we went to our cath lab and uh, passed a catheter, and then this is a snare. And the snare is reaching through the heart, grabbing whatever that mass is. And then here, is we're actually retrieving this. Away. So if you watch here, these are my fingers here, and uh, we're slowly pulling out that mass. There we go. Okay. And you're going to hear people gasping because if you haven't figured out what this mass is, it's actually worms. Her heart was jam-packed with heartworms, and the heartworms <laughs> were so plentiful, they were actually obstructing her heart. And so we had to go in and retrieve those worms out. Okay, so now these are still go. living worms and we're slowly pulling them out of our little uh, catheter site in the, the, uh, the jugular vein. So, wow. you have to excuse my hearing with our. <laughs> but we get rather excited about retrieval of worms. And I do have to apologize that um, Hazy's doing quite well, by the way. Um, I, I realize I'm running out of time, but I also want to give you a heads up. Uh, this video is a little bit graphic. Um, so cardiology not only does, uh, um, uh, you know, addressing heart disease uh, via uh, catheterization, we also do a number of other procedures, mainly vascular work. Uh, so we, we find conditions where there's abnormal blood vessels like within the liver or abnormal communications with blood vessels in the body and we can certainly catheterize them and close them. But one of my favorite procedures um, is what I wanna show you here. Um, and it's involving what is known as guttural pouch mycosis and it's something that affects horses. Uh, so this was a case I was called uh, uh, to help with up in the large animal hospital. And this was a four-year-old standard bread that presented for uncontrolled uh, uh, nasal hemorrhage or bloody nose. But we're not talking about a little bit of a bloody nose. Yep, yeah. see, I mean, that's like pulsatile blood. Now, this horse was literally bleeding out um, and uh, uh, actually was getting a blood transfusion. And we were working as quickly as we could to gain access uh, uh, to the vessel here that was causing the problem. So for those of you that aren't familiar with horses, uh, horses are a little bit different uh, in that they have what is known as a guttural pouch. And basically it's an air filled sac inside of their head right at the level of the ear. And that's what the schematic here represents. So this air filled cavity. And along the edges of that air filled cavity are some very vital uh, arteries that run uh, up to the brain delivering blood supply to the brain. And what happens with this condition is they inhale mold spores or fungal spores, and they get up in that air-filled cavity, and then literally the fungus will start growing in there and will erode or, or um, completely eat through those blood vessels. And so that's why that horse had hung uncontrolled bleeding. It was it eroded into these arteries up here, and then they were just uh, con 
you know, constantly hemorrhaging or, or bleeding, and that blood was just rolling down right through the, the nasal cavity and out the nose. Um, so this poor standard bred already had multiple transfusions. And what we need to do is go up to that site with a catheter and then uh, occlude it with little coils. Um, so a very successful procedure um, is just quite graphic. Um, and obviously that's something that we do on an emergency basis. So that kind of represents a lot of my work and the work of uh, my colleagues here at the university and the cardiology service. And one thing I wanted to leave you though is some of our future directions, like where do we want to go from here? And one of the things we always are addressing is procedural safety, trying to look at each individual case and how we can make things safer overall to improve our, uh, um, our outcomes. Because unfortunately, we still run into a case that will not make it. Uh, and it, it really uh, is hard on us. It's obviously hard on the owners. Um, and so anything we can do uh, to avoid that, uh, you know, it, it is a win-win. Um, so we, we've been working a lot with the experimental checklist, trying to uh, adopt the, the checklist system that airlines use uh, and trying to, to minimize, you know, uh, accidents uh, with uh, air travel. Um, and so ways that we can use that uh, in our procedures, uh, ways that we can work with anesthesia to ensure that the, the, the protocols uh, for safety there are being utilized. And then always looking at new devices and devices that will be safer than the established ones uh, or uh, devices that are completely allowing for a new cure that we haven't uh, had uh, until recently. One of those is valvular replacement. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of work uh, uh, looking at bringing valvular replacement using artificial heart valves that can be deployed through catheters. As you can see here, this is a catheter and there's a valve on, on top of that catheter. Um, this works really well for uh, new valves on the aorta and the, the um, pulmonic arteries, but we really want to see if we can take that technology to the mitral valve, because as many of you guys are probably aware of, mitral valve disease is a very common form of heart disease, at least in dogs. Um, so a lot of work that uh, going to, to those projects. Another one is controlling hemorrhage after the procedure. So we're using relatively large catheters, as we kind of talked about with you know, problems with cats. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we do this all incisionless, uh, that leaves a large hole uh, in that vessel afterwards. And so, yes, we do a lot of compression and ice packing, uh, ice packing and bandaging afterwards, but you still can get some uncontrolled hemorrhage. And so there's a number of different devices out there than human medicine that we've been looking at trying to, uh, uh, to bring forward and use them as a way to, to uh, patch that hole as you pull your catheter out. And that's what the schematic up here, looking at the different devices. You can see here, like there's a, like a little plug. Uh, here's some like suture material that will automatically kind of throw it a, a, a suture or ligature tie uh, to close that hole. But uh, there's a lot of work that still needs uh, 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 to be done here and in, in, uh, uh, improving that, these procedures overall. And with that, I want to leave you with my cardiology team. And uh, this is uh, a group uh, with my residents. So these are all uh, doctors that have trained here at the cardiology uh, service, uh, plus uh, the one that created the, the biggest havoc, which I, I do believe is in the audience here. Um, so uh, Pinkos. Um, but, uh, you know, my residents have all been instrumental in my work and, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, some of the projects here have actually been their work uh, that I helped them with. Uh, and certainly couldn't have done it without them. Uh, fantastic group of uh, cardiologists out there and very, very proud of all of them. As well as I'd also like a big thing to my, my technicians. I have a huge support staff uh, and these uh, 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 technicians, uh, the, these women are amazing. They know more than I do when it comes to uh, handling the machines and setting up the the uh, cath lab for procedures and everything else, and, and certainly couldn't do um, any of these procedures without their help. My residents do like to have fun with me, uh, and so uh, usually at my own expense, and, and so when I'm not there for some reason and they're doing a procedure, um, I, sometimes they come back and cover when I'm on vacation and stuff like that, uh, as what was happening here, they, they find ways to still include me. Um, and with that, I would like to go ahead and open it up to, uh, for questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing those cases, Dr. Stoudhammer, for the great presentation. It's, it's awesome to see what treatment options exist for dogs and cats with heart disease. So 
Uh, with that, if you're ready to do some of the audience questions. Certainly. Awesome. Um, I guess follow up to the horse case that you shared is the um, some audience members want to know if the horse lived. Yes, it did. Um, it did receive uh, multiple transfusions. Um, I'm amazed how quickly uh, they can uh, uh, mobilize the blood donor program in uh, equine medicine, but uh, it, it did live. Awesome. Thank you for the follow up. Um, the next one are is uh, what are some of the signs of heart disease in cats and dogs that like, owners should be looking for, watching for? Yeah, so the, the major, major signs would be uh, like exercise intolerance. So especially in puppies and kittens where you know how playful they normally are, if they're not being very playful or, or if they try to be playful and they stop and just really uh, um, act winded and they're trying to catch their breath. Um, another big one is just any kind of respiratory sign. Uh, so uh, development of a cough, uh, development uh, of uh, just an elevated uh, respiratory rate or breathing again, very heavy for no apparent reason uh, while at rest. Oh, thank you. So I think you, you kind of covered this, but I wanna circle back on it. Um, somebody asked, what is the likelihood that a cat or a dog would develop heart disease as a senior? I think you said maybe 10% of our pets would. 10% 10, 10 of the general uh, 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 veterinary uh, patients, uh, but actually 90% of uh, uh, elderly animals will have heart disease. Wow, thank you. And when is a murmur a sign of a problem? Uh, almost always. Uh, so a murmur is an abnormal heart sound that you hear with the stethoscope and generally uh, is caused by turbulent blood flow within the heart. Um, so you should not have a murmur. And most of the time it's associated with either a leaky valve or a stuck valve that's uh, causing an obstruction. Uh, you do have individuals that will have a murmur without heart disease, and we call those flow murmurs. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, again, I would say probably greater than 85, 90% of murmurs are associated with actual heart disease. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question came up a bunch, and are there breeds with greater disposition, uh, disposition towards cardiac issues? There are. Um, so, uh, you know, again, and each breed has its own uh, uh, predisposition to various types of heart disease. So unfortunately, uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels are one of our favorite uh, um, breeds of dogs. And uh, we do see them a lot uh, because of their uh, predisposition to valvular uh, heart disease or mitral valve disease specifically. Um, but we also see a similar incidence in uh, dachshunds and uh, other small breeds of dogs. Um, like with our kitties, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is very common in Maine Coons and Ragdolls and Persians, uh, as well as uh, the Sphinxes. Wow, wow thank you. Um, what should we feed our pets to improve heart health and what diet should be avoided? So yeah, that's actually a great question because that's a, a very controversial topic right now. And uh, um, it is extremely uh, um, a current topic as well. Um, the, the problem that we're seeing with grain-free diets. Um, so what it's been found is diets that are high in legumes, so lentils, peas, um, uh, beans, uh, and their derivatives, like you'll know, sometimes you'll see on the ingredients like uh, uh, pea fiber or uh, pea protein. Any of those legume products, uh, uh, we're not exactly sure how, but it, it must be through the, the processing to make the, the kibble. So we're talking predominantly dry foods. Um, that uh, what happens over time is they, they actually directly cause heart disease. They cause a, a specific form of heart disease known as dilated cardiomyopathy. And basically what that disease is, is a heart's uh, strength of its own contractions, the strength of its pumping function starts to weaken. And then over time, uh, the heart just gets larger and larger and, and completely just fails uh, as a pump altogether. Um, and so we definitely are recommending to everybody to avoid diets that are labeled as grain-free because they tend to have very high amounts of legumes with them, uh, or at least in doubt to, to look at the ingredient list and if you identify what can be considered a legume uh, to avoid that diet altogether. Uh, the FDA does have a great site uh, that lists many of the offending manufacturers, uh, those that have been caught up and reported uh, uh, to be associated with this heart disease. Um, and you can find that just by Googling the FDA site. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. And then would that advice change with the dog that has a known heart disease? disease? Yeah, so when we have known heart disease, we do recommend feeding a sodium restricted diet. Um, you know, salt is, heart, is very harmful to the heart and certainly can trigger uh, advanced progression of heart disease. 
Um, so we often will hand clients a, a kind of a huge list of all sorts of different dog foods uh, that's based on sodium content. Uh, it's also important to ensure that uh, we feed ample protein. Uh, sometimes people want to feed a, a diet that's formulated for kidney disease, to, for heart disease. And, and yes, it's very low in salt. Uh, however, it's also low in protein, and that can actually make the heart disease worse. You know, if you don't have uh, heart disease, we just recommend just kind of general, you know, uh, uh, food that is produced by, you know, your ma uh, major manufacturers that meet the all the safety requirements, uh, but when it does come to heart disease, having that sodium restriction is very beneficial. Thank you. Um, what can we do with our dog's daily routine to diminish heart disease? And does that advice change for senior dogs? Uh, the biggest thing is healthy lifestyles. What's healthy for us is healthy for them. Uh, we don't have to worry about cholesterol in dogs and cats like we do in, in humans, but uh, we certainly have to worry about the effects of obesity uh, and lack of exercise. So, you know, maintaining a healthy body weight, getting lots of exercise, not necessarily strenuous exercise, but the, you know, like going for that leash walk and, and, and you know, that kind of level of, of mild to moderate level of, of exercise is, is extremely beneficial to the heart. Thank you. So I think we have time for one last question since it is seven o'clock. And um, this one is, what is the future of mitral valve repair surgery for dogs um, in the United States? And will England and Japan be offering it again after the pandemic? Yeah, so um, that is a, a, an excellent question. Um, and uh, the future of mitral valve repair um, you know, the problem that with mitral valve repair is right now we don't have a good catheter based treatment and a lot of us are working on that and, and hopefully that will be the future. Um, currently, uh, what we're having to do is open heart surgery and again, that has its major limitations of cost and uh, um, just overall risk involved. Uh, you know, the, the rates of uh, perioperative mortality are, are, um, uh, are, are just too high, uh, unacceptably high. Uh, and again, uh, costs often being close to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. You know, obviously, not very many people can afford that. Uh, and the reason for that is you just need all this technical expertise, uh, as well as a very good surgeon to you know to open the heart and, and actually repair that valve. Back to the question: Will England and Japan start offering that again? I, that I don't know. And who knows what the pandemic, uh, what, what lasting effects will have? I do know there's been a number of centers in the U.S., including here, that have uh, had uh, developing programs, and the pandemic has completely shut all that down, uh, just because of some of the other effects of the, the pandemic as well. Um, I do uh, expect uh, for our program here to be back up and, and running probably within the next year and, and likely other sites as well, like uh, the University of or, uh, Florida, as well as uh, those centers abroad. Excellent. Thank you for taking those questions. Uh, thank you to Dr. Stouthammer for an excellent presentation. And thank you to our many participants that shared such, such thoughtful questions in advance and during the presentation. As always, the Veterinary Medical Center is here for you 24 seven to help care for your pet. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'll be pausing the health series over the summer to work on some new content and presentations for you. We are so grateful that you joined us over the past eight months and we look forward to seeing you all again this fall. If you enjoyed learning about our team's work tonight, we encourage you to visit our website or reach, or reach out to us directly to learn more about our mission to improve the health and well-being of animals and people. We hope you'll consider supporting our team in the work we do to serve animals of all shapes and sizes. Thank you again for attending tonight and we hope you have a wonderful summer. Thank you.